OK, so let's look at today's questions. Question one. How does Anne resolve the awkwardness of having to mention Captain Wentworth to Lady Russell? Why do you think the solution works? So after returning from Lyme, uh, Anne goes back to Kellynch to stay with Lady Russell. And so she, of course, has to report to Lady Russell what has happened at Lyme, Louisa's accident. Uh, but this causes some awkwardness when she mentions Captain Wentworth. Um, why? And how does she resolve this? How does she get over this? <coughs> OK, so here. When they first start talking. There was a little awkwardness at first in their discourse on another subject. So when they're first talking about this, their discourse, their conversation, it has a little awkwardness. They must speak of the accident at Lyme. Lady Russell had not been arrived five minutes the day before when a full account of the whole had burst on her. So the, the previous day, Lady Russell had just arrived back at uh, Kellynch Lodge. Uh, and she had barely gotten there when someone burst in. And gave her a full account of exactly what happened, the whole thing. Now, uh, to say burst on her, of course, does not necessarily mean that someone actually burst in to tell her. Maybe it was like a servant or something. Uh, reporting on what she had missed, the important news, uh, told her the whole thing without her having to ask. That's what this means, to burst on her. She, she didn't ask for it. Um, she wasn't prepared for it. Uh, but she had already heard the whole story. But still, it must be talked of uh, here. It means between Anne and Lady Russell. She, Anne, must make, uh, sorry, Lady Russell must make inquiries, which means she has to ask into what exactly happened. To inquire means to ask. Uh, in American English, this would be spelled beginning with an I. In British English, it begins with an E. She must uh, make inquiries. She must regret the imprudence. So of course, the imprudence of letting Louisa jump down from a high place. Um, she has to express her regret. Oh, I'm so sorry that happened. She has to she must lament the result. Lament means to say like, oh, what a pity or what a shame. So sad that this happened. What a terrible thing. And Captain Wentworth's name must be mentioned by both. Of course, because he is a main player in the situation, in the event. Uh, and this causes them, or uh, Anne, causes Anne some awkwardness. Anne was conscious of not doing it so well as Lady Russell. Um, so why does this cause Anne such awkwardness? Well, uh, the next paragraph tells us. Uh, we'll get to that. Um, so Anne was conscious, was aware of not doing it so well as Lady Russell, as of not being able to mention Captain Wentworth and uh, not look or feel awkward. Lady Russell is better at this. She, Anne, could not speak the name and look straight forward to Lady Russell's eye. Uh, so every time she mentions Captain Wentworth, she has to look away from Lady Russell. Till she had adopted the expedient of telling her briefly what she thought of the attachment between him and Louisa. So she kept being unable to look Lady Russell in the eye 
until she found the way to adopt the expedient means to use the, the way of telling Lady Russell briefly what she thought of the attachment between him and Louisa. So remember, because uh, Captain Wentworth and Louisa kept chatting with each other, spending time together, everyone basically thought that they would marry each other. Or at this point, maybe that they still will marry each other. Uh, this is their attachment. So by telling Lady Russell uh, that, first of all, that um, Wentworth and Louisa seem to be attached, uh, and so therefore not um, speaking of Wentworth as someone whom uh, Anne might still uh, marry. When this was told, his name distressed her no longer. Uh, because it's no longer awkward if uh, the two are still single, are both single and uh, not together and things like that. It's just very awkward, but if they can talk about Wentworth with Louisa, then Anne is no longer involved, so she no longer has to feel awkward. But why, uh, aside from the particular history between Anne and Wentworth, why specifically uh, it, does Anne find it awkward to talk to um, Lady Russell about this? <coughs> the next paragraph tells us. Lady Russell had only to listen composedly and wish them happy. Uh, so when Anne mentions that Wentworth is with Louisa, Lady Russell only has to wish them happy. She doesn't have to give her own uh, lengthy opinion about this situation. But internally, her heart revelled in angry pleasure, in pleased contempt. That the man who at 23 had seemed to understand somewhat the val of the value of an Anne Elliot should eight years afterwards be charmed by a Louisa Musgrove. So this is a very interesting sentence. What it means is um, Lady Russell, of course, thinks that Anne is the best woman uh, and of course better than Louisa. So now Captain Wentworth eight or nine years ago was still able to understand the value of an Anne Elliot. Uh, he loved her, he wanted to marry her. But eight years later, he is only able to be charmed by Louisa Musgrove. It's a decline, decrease in taste, I guess. Taste in partner. Uh, or in, in um, the esteem of a person. So this decline or this decrease makes Lady Russell feel angry pleasure Please contempt. Why? Because at this point we should remember that it is Lady Russell who wanted Anne to break up with Captain Wentworth. It was, of course, her uh, own family, Sir Walter and Elizabeth, uh, were opposed, but Anne mostly only listened to Lady Russell, the wise and uh, conventional woman who gives her advice. So Lady Russell is now angry because Captain Wentworth uh, was now apparently chasing Louisa instead of Anne, right? It's a decrease in value, but she's happy because it proves that she herself was right to have them break off the engagement. If Captain Wentworth uh, really does think that Louisa is the better choice, then Lady Russell was correct that he would have been a bad husband choice for Anne. So she's happy that uh, the events have proven herself right. Same as this, pleased contempt. Um, she has contempt for Captain Wentworth because uh, he now seems to be chasing Louisa instead of the better Anne, but she's pleased because again, this proves that she is right. 
So this is why Anne is especially uh, when she feels especially awkward when talking to Lady Russell about Captain Wentworth, because Lady Russell is the person who broke them up. Where's the? OK, uh, next question. The novel mentions that Anne makes visits of charity in the village of Kellynch. What do you think this might say about class relations of that time? Why? OK, so let's take a look at this. Um, let's see, where is it? OK. Um, so this passage, this section is talking about how uh, Lady Russell and Anne are expecting Captain Benwick to stop by Kellynch, but he never seems to come. Uh, so both are always anxiously awaiting his arrival. Lady Russell could not hear the doorbell without feeling that it might be his herald. A herald is someone who runs before to announce his arrival. So it's like a kind of servant or a driver. Um, so if Captain Benwick arrives, it will be the herald who shows up to say uh, Captain Benwick is here. Nor could Anne return from any stroll of solitary indulgence in her father's grounds or any visit of charity in the village without wondering whether she might see him or hear of him. Captain Benwick came not, however. OK, so uh, in comparison with this sentence, uh, the first this sentence is describing the situation in which Lady Russell is awaiting Captain Benwick. So the next sentence should uh, we expect describe Anne's situations when she's awaiting Captain Benwick. So what is she doing as she waits for him? Taking a stroll of solitary indulgence in her father's grounds. So taking a walk near Kellynch Hall by herself. Right, solitary by herself. And it's an indulgence, 重容自己, because uh, Kellynch Hall is now no longer the place where she and her father live, right? It's where Admiral Croft and Mrs. Croft live. So she's basically walking on the grounds of someone else's home now. OK, so that's the first thing she might be doing. The second thing is a visit of charity in the village. So this is something that she does. She visits the village in a spirit of charity. Hmm. So we know that when we talk about a place like Kellynch, we're not just talking about the building, the main building, Kellynch Hall. We're also talking about the building for guests, Kellynch Lodge, where Lady Russell lives. And we're also talking about the farmland and the uh, homes that are rented out by the farmers. And it apparently it also includes a village. Apparently there's a village in Kellynch as well, where the common people gather for business and, and market, things like that. But all of this is owned by Sir Walter because he's a noble. He's from the upper class. All the land belongs to him. Uh, so in this system, the feudal system, as we mentioned last week, Fengjianzidu, the noble who owns the land also has a moral obligation to take care of the people who live on the land. So in this case, that would be the villagers and the farmers. So the the noble Sir Walter is supposed to like go around once in a while to see what his people need to see if he can help them out in some way. But we know that Sir Walter is incredibly vain and selfish, so it looks like Anne is the person who does this. And it's a visit of charity, which means kindness, 施舍, 
not a visit of duty. Because as I said, the noble has a moral obligation to do this, but not a legal obligation. Uh, so this is getting into the second part of this question, right? What do you think this might say about class relations of that time? So uh, class relations at that time are like this. The king and queen own everything. Uh, and they might, um, in order to help them uh, govern well or like to take care of the country better, would give titles and land to like family members or people who did something important for the country for themselves. Uh, and so in just so it's a classic feudal system, right? Where nobles are each uh, in charge of different parts of the country, but they all have to obey the king and queen. Now, uh, Today in a democracy, we have something similar where a politician is supposed to uh, take care of his or her voters. So the politician will hold meetings or like town hall gatherings to hear uh, what the voters need or if the voters have any ideas about government policy. But we don't call them visits of charity because uh, we expect them to do this. It's part of their job. That is a duty, right? Uh, we vote for them. We choose them to enter government for us. And therefore they should respond to what we need. But back in uh, the days of the monarchy, that's not true. Uh, today, uh, most, we, most of us, I shouldn't say most of us. Today, the the general idea is that the most important class is the middle class, uh, because um, the middle class are the people who are most affected by government policy, including taxes. Right, uh, the working class may not make enough money, or I should say, the lower class may not make enough money to worry about taxes, but the middle class usually does. And so if the middle class are the main group of voters, then the government has to pay particular attention to what the middle class wants and needs. But back in those days, the main class or the most important class is the, or was the upper class, right? Royals and nobles. The country, the government were all the uh, under the care and responsibility of the upper class. Uh, we could say that the country belonged to them. Now, at the time, there was already a parliament in England, but it, it worked differently than it does today. Parliament at the time was chosen by the uh, queen and king and the prime minister. To uh, So like today, we England votes for its representatives in parliament. But back in those days, it was the king and queen who chose and assigned people, nobles from each region to enter parliament. Uh, today, we, when we talk about the government of the UK, we talk about the prime minister, the ruling party. But during the days of the monarchy, the prime minister was simply in charge of uh, executing the king's policy taking care of the country's um, business so that the king didn't have to worry about everything day to day, right? It takes a lot of people and a lot of details to run a country. Uh, you can't put that all on one person. So even during the monarchy, there was a government, a civil service of government workers under the guidance of the chosen prime minister who took care of the daily business of the government and who was in charge of carrying out and implementing the policies and directives of the king and queen. Uh, so on the surface, it looked like or it looks like the government structure is very similar to today. But the 
the emphasis and the way that people are chosen was very different. Right today we focus more on the middle class, but in those days it was the upper class who was the most important. And we can see this change in that one word of charity. OK, um, let's see. Uh, next question. Hold on, let me yawn. <sighs> OK, question three. What values do you think Mr. Elliot's apology to and reconciliation with Sir Walter might appeal to? Why do you think the unfeudal tone of the present day might be a bad thing? OK, sorry, so we, we have we have not yet talked about uh, feudalism, Feng Jian Zidu, but uh, I guess we just we just talked about it. OK, so this question is asking when Mr. Elliot finally shows up to apologize to Sir Walter, how does he do it? What does he say that helps make Sir Walter accept his apology? Right when we apologize, we're not simply saying I'm sorry. We're also trying to uh, repair our relationship with the person that we're apologizing to. So the most uh, the best way to do this is to appeal to some kind of values or ideas that the other person might agree with to form like a, a common basis, a shared basis for continuing the relationship. So what kind of values does Mr. Elliot invoke or appeal to in his apology to Sir Walter? OK, so let's take a look at this 91, 92. Hang on. The second question, why do you think the feudal tone, uh, unfeudal tone of the present day might be a bad thing? We can answer this directly, right? We just talked about how uh, the government of that time was a feudal government, Feng Jian Zidu. Uh, so it, uh, according to that social logic, feudalism is good, right? It's it's the logic of the upper class, all of these nobles forming relations with each other, hoping to approach the king and queen. So it's a if that was the main social logic of the time, then its opposite would, of course, be a bad thing for these upper class people, right? The unfeudal tone of the present day is sort of complaining about how uh, society more and more does not behave according to the logic of feudalism. We'll see this in more detail when we look at the novel. 91, 92. OK. So let's see. OK, um, Mr. Elliot had been in Bath about a fortnight, which means two weeks. Um, and in the middle, he explains the novel explains, but you can tell at this point that this is from the perspective of uh, Anne's family talking about what Mr. Elliot had told them. So it's indirect information. He had passed through Bath in November, his way to London, when the intelligence of Sir Walter's being settled there had of course reached him, though only 24 hours in the place, but he had not been able to avail himself of it. So he had already, according to, uh, let's say, Elizabeth's account of what Mr. Elliot said, he said that in fact he had passed through Bath earlier and he already knew intelligence that Sir Walter was there, but he had only 24 hours in Bath so he was unable to visit them. But he had now been a fortnight in Bath, again, two weeks, and his first object or goal 
on arriving had been to leave his card in Camden Place. This is where the Elliots are staying. So to leave his card there means like to to say hello, to to let them know that he is there. Right. This is today. We still have business cards. Well, I guess most of us still understand the idea of business cards, but now fewer and fewer people actually use them. But in those days, there was not only business cards, there were also social cards. Cards you would use uh, on a social visit. So, for example, if you're going to a friend's house, uh, you would first send a servant with your card to rush over and present your card uh, to your friend so that your friend would know that you're coming. And so they would not be surprised. Uh, this is this, of course, was before the invention of the telephone. Uh, so on first arriving, the first thing he did was to leave his card with the Elliots. Following it up by such assiduous endeavors to meet. So after announcing that he was in Bath, he tried very hard to meet with the Elliots. Assiduous means like very trying very hard, very dutifully. Endeavor means attempt to try. And when they did meet by such great openness of conduct, such readiness to apologize for the past, such solicitude to be received as a relation again, that their former good understanding was completely reestablished. So solicitude means to express a desire to, to want someone else to do something for you. And the thing that Mr. Elliot wants is to be received as a relation again. To once again be welcomed into the Elliot family. And so they reconciled. So how did he do this? They had not a fault to find in him. He had explained away all the appearance of neglect on his own side. So remember, Elizabeth was especially angry at Mr. Elliot because he kept ignoring them after giving him two or even more invitations to like visit or to attend social events. Uh, he never showed up and he never even replied. Right, so that's neglect. But here it says that he had explained away all the appearance of neglect on his own side. It had originated in misapprehension entirely. So misapprehension today we would say misunderstanding. Entirely. This word entirely tells us that we have once again taken the perspective of Mr. Elliot. So this paragraph is from his point of view. Right, this is the kind of thing you would say. Uh, when you are apologizing for yourself, right? Or today we would say like, no, it was not that way at all. The at all is the same thing as this entirely. He had never had an idea. Sorry, he had never had an idea of throwing himself off. Uh, so here to throw himself off means to break off from the family, to separate from the family. He had feared that he was thrown off, but knew not why. So this is interesting. He said he would never break off. He was afraid that he was being broken off with. So from active to passive. Uh, he was afraid that it, it was he who was being broken off with, but he didn't know why. And delicacy, which here means politeness, had kept him silent. So he's saying it would have been very impolite and awkward if he asked them why they were breaking off relations with him. So in order to be polite, he didn't ask, didn't say anything. Now we know that he is lying through his teeth. The Elliots uh, had repeatedly tried to communicate with him and he had repeatedly ignored them. So he's just simply lying. Uh, but he's, he's, he tells this lie and he is able to succeed in telling this lie because 
what the Elliots care about is to have him as a relation as part of their family. It doesn't matter uh, why previously he had left. And it doesn't really matter uh, what he says, whether what he says is true or not. The point is that he wants to rejoin the family. And so since this is something that both sides want, uh, the Elliots can be persuaded to accept him very easily. This is just like when the Elliots are renting out their home to the Crofts. Remember the first week we talked about their meeting. Their meeting succeeds basically because both sides already want to succeed. Same here, both sides want Mr. Elliot to rejoin the family, so his apology is very quickly accepted. But let's continue to see uh, the how he actually apologizes. So first he says, uh, I didn't want to break off. I thought it was you breaking up with me. Upon the hint of having spoken disrespectfully or carelessly of the family and the family honors, he was quite indignant. Remember, this is the second thing Elizabeth complained about, that he she had heard that he was talking disrespectfully of the Elliots. Uh, so when this is mentioned to him, he was very indignant. He who had ever boasted of being an Elliot and whose feelings as to connection were only too strict to suit the unfeudal tone of the present day. Uh, so this, of course, is his own protestations, his own uh, declamations profession of loyalty to the family. He had ever boasted of being an Elliot. Boasted, of course, means he's proud of. Um, now the word ever here means always, but in modern English today, we don't use it like this. In English today, the word ever means at least once. Have you ever read Jane Austen? Which means have you read Jane Austen before at least once? Uh, so it no longer means always. So he was always proud of being an Elliot and his feelings as to connection were only too strict. Which means the feeling towards connection connection here means family connection. So his feeling if his feelings toward connection are strict, it means that uh, he believes that family will always be connected and like uh, family connections are always more important than non family connections. Uh, and are, these are too strict to suit the unfeudal tone of the present day. So here what he's doing is he's creating a contrast, a comparison. Between uh, his own values and the values of that time of that society that are growing ever less feudal. Is it true? No idea, but Mr. Elliot by saying this creates a situation where his own values are seen as better. Right, he's he's giving us a bad situation and comparing himself to that situation in order to make himself look better. By pointing out the unfeudal tone of the present day, he was kind of saying like um, the things that you thought I was doing to the family maybe are not that surprising because of the atmosphere of society today. But I assure you, I am not like that. I am extremely feudal. I, I value our family connection highly. Right? He's comparing that contrast, that difference. He was astonished indeed. Uh, you know, surprised that people would think this about him or say this about him. But his character and general conduct must refute it. So here he's saying if you look at his character, right, his personality, and you look at what he does, his actions and words and behavior, you will see that these rumors are false. They must refute it. 
He could refer Sir Walter to all who knew him. Ah, so to, in modern English, we would say, if you don't believe me, ask anyone who knows me. They will tell you that I'm telling the truth. Now, usually when someone says this, the, the other person doesn't really go to ask everyone. So it's kind of a bluff. It's kind of. Um, it's kind of bullshitting Sir Walter. It's a phrase that gives Sir Walter confidence without having to actually offer evidence. Uh, for his. Actually uh, feeling this way about rejoining the family. Uh, now the word refer. Um, today, if you apply for a job, the requirement might include something like two references or three references. Uh, so what this means is as exactly as this word is used here, people who can recommend you or people who can describe your good personality and uh, you know, Describe why you are a good candidate for this job. Um, so the word reference, the noun, used to refer to, haha, <laughs> refer to, used to mean uh, what today we would call letters of recommendation. So references can refer to the people, and it can also refer to the letters that these people might write for you when you're applying for a job or like for graduate school or something that requires references. OK, continuing. And certainly the pains he had been taking on this, the first opportunity of reconciliation to be restored to the footing of a relation and heir presumptive was a strong proof of his opinions on the subject. So in plain English, uh, it, he's saying if up to this point you still don't believe me, then the effort, pains here means effort, that he is uh, using to return to the family, the fact that he's trying so hard to apologize and return to the family should be strong proof uh, that he really does believe what he's saying. Right, his opinions, his beliefs on the subject, which is, of course, his apology. Um, so rejoining the family here is called restored to the footing of a relation and heir presumptive. So we know that relation means family. We already know this. Footing means stance, position. We still sometimes see this used in this way today. So for example, if a country was preparing to go to war, the news might say that the country is uh, ch changing to a war footing, which means a war stance. You can think of this like preparing to fight, right? You would uh, move your feet to prepare to fight. Um, so this means stance or position. And what is his position in the family? If you remember from the Baronetage, that book from chapter one, he is the heir presumptive, which means if Sir Walter does not have a son before he dies, then Mr. Elliot would become the next Sir Walter. But it's only presumptive because if Sir Walter does have a son, then Mr. Elliot would no longer be the next Sir Walter. Um, so that's his apology. Let's look again at what he does. First, he's saying uh, he he didn't really want to break off from the family. It was all a misunderstanding. And I never spoke ill of the family. I would never speak ill of the family. I'm proud of being an Elliot, and I believe in the importance of family relations. And if you don't believe what I'm saying, ask anyone who knows me. And if even if you don't believe them, the fact that I am taking so much trouble to apologize to you and to re to try to rejoin the family 
should show you that I'm being uh, serious and sincere about my apology. Uh, wait, are we supposed to end at uh, 1040? Well, no, we, we begin at 1010. We end at 11. OK, uh, didn't like him because I married the rich man. Of his... Huh? OK, this is an interesting question. Uh, he didn't like Mr. Elliot. Yes, uh, because Mr. Elliot married a common woman, uh, but also because uh, Sir Walter and Elizabeth tried many times to invite Mr. Elliot for tea, uh, to to rebuild their relationship, but Mr. Elliot never replied. And in fact, when Elizabeth was walking around in London, she heard that Mr. Elliot was talking bad things about the Elliot family. Uh, so that's another main reason why Sir Walter hates or used to hate Mr. Elliot. But as you can see, uh, this means that actually he wanted Mr. Elliot back in the family. So their attitude never really changed too much. So like even though even when Mr. Elliot married a common woman, I think Sir Walter was simply disappointed. He never really wanted to kick Mr. Elliot out of the family. Uh, so their attitude didn't really change. It's Mr. Elliot's attitude who has sudden which has suddenly changed. And uh, we don't yet know why. We will learn why later. Uh, right, because right now Mr. Elliot is saying also that he himself never changed the attitude. So that's the value that he is appealing to in his apology. The value of the importance of family connections. And being able to to tell this a story about how he had never wanted to leave the family in the first place. And the apology works because Mr. Elliot. Uh, Sorry, Sir Walter always wanted Mr. Elliot as part of the family. So any excuse of an apology would work, even if it's a bald faced lie. Um, OK, moving on to the next question. I'll give you the question first and then we'll take a short break. Question four, why do you think Mr. Elliot's personality makes Lady Russell believe that his marriage was an unhappy one? An idea confirmed by Colonel Wallace. So basically this is saying why. The why, how is Lady Russell able to say that Mr. Elliot's marriage was unhappy simply based on his personality and what he does, how he behaves. So remember Mr. Elliot's wife had recently died. He is technically still in mourning the one year mourning period. I doubt she. Um, so how do we explain this? Uh, let's take a short break and we will look into this question. Uh, after the break. Uh, and remember, I'm still recording during the break. Do you have other questions? OK, so let's come back after the break.
And we're back. So the question is, how can Lady Russell tell that Mr. Elliot's marriage was unhappy simply from his personality? Let's take a look at this. Um, so here, this is um, Lady Russell talking. As Mr. Elliot became known to her, which means as Mr. Elliot became more familiar to her, as they got to know each other better, she grew more charitable or more indifferent towards the others. So her attention was more and more put on Mr. Elliot. His manners were an immediate recommendation, so he has good manners. And on conversing with him, on talking with him, she found the solid so fully supporting the superficial. So superficial means, of course, like uh, on the surface. So this would be referring to his manners. Uh, but the solid, which is what is underneath the surface, fully supported the superficial. So his personality, his character were equally as good as his manners. That she, uh, Lady Russell, was at first, as she told Anne, almost ready to exclaim, can this be Mr. Elliot? And could not seriously picture to herself a more agreeable or estimable man. So remember, we said esteem, estimable means uh, from the word esteem, which means to appreciate or to value. So estimable means valuable or like good, basically. Worth it. Worthy. Everything united in him. Good understanding, correct opinions, knowledge of the world, and a warm heart. He had strong feelings of family attachment and family honor without pride or weakness. He lived with the liberality of a man of fortune without display. So he it, he lives like a wealthy man without but without display, which means he doesn't show off his wealth. Um, we know that if someone shows off how wealthy they are, they probably only became wealthy very recently. They aren't truly a person of wealth. They simply have money. Right, a person of wealth would need would not need to show off their wealth. Uh, they wouldn't feel the need to do so, and also because usually wealthy people have friends who are also wealthy, and so showing off your wealth to people who are also wealthy doesn't really do anything. So here it says he lived like a real man of wealth, a real man of fortune with liberality, which means he's not afraid to spend money, but without display, which means he only spends when he needs to, not to show off. He judged for himself in everything essential, uh, which means that in all the important things, he himself makes the judgment. He himself decides. He doesn't go around asking other people for advice. He doesn't listen to the first thing that someone else tells him to do. He decides for himself. But without defying public opinion in any point of worldly decorum. So even though he judges for himself without asking for advice, those judgments that he makes do not go against public opinion when it comes to what is proper and what is not proper. That's what decorum means. So he makes good judgments. He was steady, observant, moderate, candid. So moderate means not extreme. He's always very composed and steady. Candid means honest and open. He is never run away with by spirits or by selfishness, which fancied itself strong feeling. So he's not run away with by. To, OK, so first of all, to be run away with. Today we would say he never loses his head. 
he never uh, goes crazy because of spirits, which means alcohol, nor because of selfishness, which fancied itself strong feeling. So fancy means imagine. So it, apparently some people uh, say or think that they themselves have strong feelings. They feel very passionate about something. They're very enthusiastic about something, and so they must follow that passion. Uh, but in fact, that's not really strong feeling. That's just selfishness. So like uh, an example might be. Um, I love movies, so I absolutely have to go see this movie and I'm dragging you with me to share in the joy. It seems like it's strong feeling. But if the person you're taking to the movie doesn't want to go, that's just selfishness. So here it's saying that Mr. Elliot is never carried away, never loses his head because of alcohol or because of the kind of selfishness which people think, uh, the kind of strong feeling that people think of as selfishness. No, no, the kind of selfishness which many people think is strong feeling. So anyway, in other words, he, be, he behaves properly. And yet with a sensibility to what was amiable and lovely and a value for all the felicities of domestic life, which characters of fancied enthusiasm and violent agitation seldom really possess. So we're continuing with this idea of fancied enthusiasm, right? Fancied strong feeling, imagined enthusiasm. So unlike uh, these people, he does have, he is sensible to what is amiable, which means friendly and welcoming and lovely. And he does value the felicities, the small happinesses, Xiao Xing, of domestic life. So basically uh, the women's side of the household, Right, taking care of the home, taking care of the family, uh, doing social parties and, and maintaining relationships with friends and family, relatives, domestic life. So he appreciates the small happinesses of domestic life. And this is something that those people who have fancied enthusiasm or even violent agitation these people seldom really understand this. Uh, these things. Uh, violent agitation. So to be agitated means to be worked up, to be annoyed or angry about something. But agitation could also mean uh, rebellion, revolt, protest. Uh, so we're talking about social political movements. Uh, so violent agitation would, of course, mean something like rebellion or armed revolt, that kind of thing. Um, so here it's making that comparison and applying it to a person. It's saying when someone has fancied enthusiasm, it's just like uh, a country that has violent agitation. Like it, it's. And remember, this is from the point of view of the upper class. So even if protesters are right and they they're fighting for something that they do deserve and should have, if it turns violent, uh, the people that they protest against, which are usually the upper class, see this as a bad thing. So violent agitation is to carry that fancied enthusiasm to an extreme. Um, and the very next sentence, she was sure that he had not been happy in marriage. Huh. Colonel Wallace, uh, Mr. Elliot's friend, said it, and Lady Russell saw it. But it had been no unhappiness to sour his mind. Uh, OK, so let's stop here. To, so even if he was unhappy, 
the unhappiness did not spoil his mind. Um, and this sort of gives us a hint to how she can tell that. No, no, no. OK, let's let's keep this line for later. Let's let's stop here. So uh, explaining how Mr. Elliot is such a good person, such a kind person, such a perfect gentleman. Why would this lead Lady Russell to think that his marriage was an unhappy marriage? Well, we actually have a comparison. We know that Mr. Elliot is mourning his dead wife. We have someone else in the novel who is also mourning a dead wife or fiance, Captain Benwick. Right, his fiance Fanny Harville died before they could get married. And now look at Captain Benwick. He's a sad sack. Uh, he's, he's moping around all day. He feels terrible about himself. He can barely hold a conversation with anyone but Anne. He is so sad that he worries the Harvilles who keep him at their house to make sure nothing goes wrong. And compare that to Mr. Elliot, who actually did get married and his wife died, but now he's still able to present himself as a perfect gentleman. He says all the right things. He does all the right things. He presents himself in all the right ways. As kind and warm and how does he do that? Isn't he supposed to be incredibly sad about his wife's death? So from this Lady Russell concludes that it must have not have been a happy marriage. Uh, so that he's still able to do this even after she dies. And so when she asks Colonel Wallace about this. Uh, he confirms it correct that marriage was not a happy one. But even though it was an unhappy marriage, it had been no unhappiness to sour his mind. So um, sometimes people will think that if they get out of a bad relationship, everything will be back to the way it used to be. That's not true. Time does not go in reverse. You cannot erase what has happened from your life and from your experience. So much more often when you see someone who has recently gotten divorced or gotten out of a marriage that was terrible, they're no longer the same person. They, they are sometimes filled with bitterness, regret, anger. So that's what she means when she says that the unhappiness sours uh, or did not sour his mind, did not ruin his mind. To sour uh, means to go sour. Today we use this to talk about milk that goes bad. If milk goes sour, that means it goes bad. So his mind had not gone bad. His mind had not ruined. Uh, the unhappy marriage had not ruined his mind. Um, it seems to me there might be a slight contradiction here. The same evidence that she uses to judge his marriage to be unhappy is the same evidence that she uses to judge that his mind had not been soured by the marriage. So is it one or the other? No, 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 there is no contradiction. Sorry. No, because it is a fact that he was married. Um, so yeah, this is a logical conclusion. He appears fine, so the marriage must have been unhappy. But he is not overcompensating. He's not trying too hard to be a perfect gentleman. He gets it just right. So his mind is still healthy and working well. OK, um, next question. Anne says that I suppose I have more pride than any of the other Elliot's. Do you agree? Why or why not? OK. So we know about what kind of person Anne is. 
why would she say that she has more pride than Sir Walter, more pride than Elizabeth? Here, I suppose I have more pride than any of you. So here she's talking to Mr. Elliot, and they are talking about the recent arrival of the Dowager Viscountess Dalrymple, Lady Dalrymple, and her friend, the Honorable Miss Carteret. So these two people have recently arrived in Bath. And they are, or at least Lady Dalrymple is socially important, right? She's not just a, a baronet, um, Marquess, a wife of a baronet, or something. Like, remember, Sir Walter is a baronet, which is a very low title. But Lady Dalrymple is a dowager viscountess. Uh, Viscountess. So, OK, a count is a very high title. A Viscount is slightly lower than a count. And a Viscountess is the Viscount's wife. A dowager is the mother of uh, the Viscount or, the, or his wife. So she, Lady Dalrymple is not just a Viscountess. She is the mother of the current Viscountess. We see the word dowager most often uh, when we read about Chinese history and we read about Cixi Taiho, who in English, her title is the Dowager Empress uh, because she is the mother of the emperor. And the Honorable Miss Carteret. So the word honorable tells us that Miss Carteret is not a noble. She's a common person. Um, I think that's right. Sorry, I'm not British. I'm not too familiar with how royalty works. Um, but anyways, they or Miss D Lady Dalrymple is royalty. Sir Walter is also royalty. So they are related, our cousins. And because Lady Dalrymple is so socially important, uh, we know that Sir Walter cares about this kind of thing. So he tries very hard to form relations with Lady Dalrymple uh, to get her acknowledgement that they are related because that acknowledgement would make Sir Walter more socially important. But here's the thing. It turns out that yes, Lady Dalrymple and Miss Carteret are important, but they have terrible parties. They have terrible conversations. It's just so boring to be around them. So here Mr. Elliot is talking with Anne about how Everyone in Bath wants to make the acquaintance of Lady Dalrymple and Miss Carteret, wants to form relations with them. Everyone except for Anne. Uh, and we know that this is because Anne doesn't really care too much about social importance. She cares more about if people are good, if they have good conversations, if it is worth her time to be around them, to spend time with them. So in Anne's eyes, Lady Dalrymple is not something who is worth knowing. But everyone else thinks the opposite. And that's why here she says, hang on. <sighs> that's why here she says, I suppose I have more pride than any of you. Um. She's the only person who does not care about Lady Dalrymple. And I guess that it could be seen as a kind of pride. Sure. Um, but it's a different kind of pride from the pride of Sir Walter and 
Elizabeth. Remember, they care about social relations, social importance. The better social relations they have, the more proud they are of themselves. It's the same kind of pride that most of upper class society had at the time. Now, of course, Sir Walter and Elizabeth have more of that pride than most people, but it's the same kind of pride. Mary also, remember Mary also has that kind of pride. She has to be treated better than common people because she is a noble. Um, so I don't think it's possible to compare these two kinds of pride and say which is more, which is less. Right, Sir Walter, Elizabeth and Mary are proud of their social standing and social situation. Whereas Anne is proud of knowing good people, spending time with people that are worth spending time with. Uh, and so she doesn't care about social importance. I don't know if that's more pride. It's a different kind of pride. OK, so those are the five questions. Uh, up to this point, do you want to ask something? Something you don't understand uh, that you want to ask me? Anything? Questions? No questions? OK, so let's jump back to the beginning of chapter 13. So remember Anne had just left Lyme uh, to return to Uppercross uh, to take care of the young Musgrove children while Charles and Mary remain with everyone else at Lyme to make sure that Louisa is still alive. I, I was about to say to make sure that Louisa is OK, but of course she's not OK. She's in a coma to make sure that uh, she does not worsen. She doesn't die. OK, the remainder of Anne's time at Uppercross, comprehending only two days, was spent entirely at the mansion house. So comprehending here means uh, including or having the parts of. It's the opposite of to make up. So this sentence also means uh, two days made up the rest of Anne's stay at Uppercross. Today in modern English, we wouldn't use the word comprehend in this way. Instead, we use the word comprise. Which means the same thing. So these two days she stays at the great house where Mr and Mrs Musgrove, the grandparents live. And. Uh, she had the satisfaction of knowing herself extremely useful there. Both as an immediate companion and as assisting in all those arrangements for the future, which in Mr and Mrs Musgrove's distressed state of spirits would have been difficulties. So uh, because of Louisa, Mr and Mrs Musgrove are in a distressed state of spirits. Very upset, unable to think clearly, so hard to make arrangements for the future. And this is where Anne is able to help them. They had an early account from Lyme the next morning. Louisa was much the same. Ah, so this early account, I believe, is a letter. A letter from Lyme. Louisa was much the same. No symptoms were worse than before had appeared. Charles came a few hours afterwards. This is Charles Musgrove. Came a few hours afterwards to bring a later and more particular account. Remember the word particular means detailed. He was tolerably cheerful. 
Um, so, you know, when talking about Louise's accident, you can't really be cheerful. You can only try your best not to be too sad. So that's what the novel calls tolerably cheerful. So what does he say? The novel jumps directly into his perspective. A speedy cure must not be hoped, but everything was going on as well as the nature of the case admitted. So she's not going to be fine very quickly, but it's all going OK so far. In speaking of the Harvilles, he seemed unable to satisfy his own sense of their kindness, especially of Mrs. Harville's exertions as a nurse. So he was unable to praise their kindness enough. They are too kind for him to be able to adequately describe how kind they are. That's what satisfy means, right? To do something to satisfaction. Uh, and he's unable to describe their kindness to his satisfaction because they are simply too kind. Especially about Mrs. Harville taking care of Louisa. Exertions means efforts. She really left nothing for Mary to do, he says. He and Mary had been persuaded to go early to their inn last night. Mary had been hysterical again this morning. OK. So the word hysterical basically just means to lose your head. To be run away with, as we just saw. Or to be carried away, to let feelings overwhelm your reason, your rationality. In Chinese, we call this xie si di di. Um, but I should tell you that the word hysterical today is not used very much because uh, it is it discriminates against women. It's true that uh, men can also act in a way that could be described as hysterical, but few people use hysterical to talk about men. And this is because hysteria the state of being hysterical was traditionally seen as involving uh, a woman's body in some way, like the uterus, zigong, uh, according to older medical theories. Uh, so, I mean, as I said, obviously men get hysterical too. Um, but when a woman becomes hysterical, this is often blamed on the fact that she is a woman. So that's deeply unfair. And in psychoanalysis, Jing and Fenshi, Freud uh, came up with a theory that it had something to do with a woman's mind or body or whatever. So it ended up whenever a woman his, it became hysterical, doctors tended to blame the woman instead of whatever was causing the hysteria whatever was causing the woman to become hysterical. Uh, so now we don't use this word anymore because it's biased and prejudiced against women. But here it simply means that Mary had once again lost her head, had become irrational, overcome by emotion this morning. When he came away from Lyme, she was going to walk out with Captain Benwick, which he hoped would do her good. Uh, so when someone became hysterical, the medical cure was usually one of two things. Either you go outside and get some exercise, so like walking around, or um, you lie in bed and take a nap and rest. Not quite sure how effective these two cures were, but that was what doctors at the time uh, told people who were hysterical to do. He almost wished she had been prevailed on to come home the day before. So to be prevailed on, to prevail means to succeed. To be prevailed on means to be persuaded. 
to come home the day before, but the truth was that Mrs. Harville left nothing for anybody to do. So this paragraph is also very interesting. On the surface, it looks like it is praising Mrs. Harville. She's such a good, kind nurse that Mary couldn't really find anything to help her with. But underneath this surface, we have descriptions of Mary being hysterical, having to take a walk with Captain Benwick. So in fact, it seems like Charles is kind of blaming his wife for once again uh, her nonsense. Remember last week we talked about Mary's nonsense. This seems to be yet another example. So even though it's, uh, I mean, the conclusion is the same, right? Mary doesn't really help out there. But on the surface, it looks like the reason for this is because Mrs. Harville is so kind and so good at taking care of Louisa. When actually the reason is because Mary uh, has a personality that is very hard for her to help other people. Charles was to return to Lyme the same afternoon, and his father had at first half a mind to go with him, but the ladies could not consent. So Mr. Musgrove wanted to go to Lyme with Charles, but the ladies would not let him. It would be going only to multiply trouble to the others, to cause trouble for the others, and increase his own distress, um, because he would then have to look at Louisa uh, lying in bed, fainted, and that would make him even more upset. And a much better scheme or plan, scheme means plan, a much better scheme followed and was acted upon. OK, so what was the plan? A chase, which is again a kind of carriage, matsu, was sent for from Krukern. I guess Krukern must be nearby or something. And Charles conveyed back a far more useful person in the old nursery maid of the family. Uh, a nursery maid, a nursery is where young children live in the house where they sleep. And a nursery maid, therefore, is the maid who takes care of the children. So she is very good at taking care of people. Uh, notice this grammar, a far more useful person in the old nursery maid. What this means is the old nursery maid is a far more useful person. We still use this kind of sentence today. Um, we say something like. Um, a good assistant in the person of his sister. Which means that his sister is a good assistant. The idea is they're looking for this kind of person and they found this kind of person in a particular person. So in this sentence, they are looking for a useful person and they find a useful person in the old nursery maid. Kind of like how we would find someone in the living room, that kind of grammar or in the dining room. So who is this old nursery maid who having brought up all the children? and seen the very last, the lingering and long petted Master Harry sent to school after his brothers was now living. OK, so let's stop here for a second. So the very last, which means the very youngest child is Harry, and even he is now sent off to school. Uh, he was lingering, which means he stayed at home for a long time. I guess that means he was much younger than his older siblings. And he was long petted, which means as when he was at home, people liked to pet him. Um, today we use the word pet to refer to animals, but this used to refer to young children and to um, women in a romantic relationship. Um, in fact, uh, we see this kind of thing still. The word kid, right, a, a child. Uh, the word kid also used to refer to a younger woman in a relationship. 
Um, so people liked to pet Master Harry, and it's even though he's a kid, it, it is Master Harry because this is from the perspective of the maid. The maid is the servant, therefore Harry is the master. So now that Harry is gone and there are no children in the house, uh, the nursery maid was now living in her deserted nursery to mend stockings, to mend sto uh, to repair socks, Joseph uh, Bouazin, and dress all the blains and bruises she could get near her. So a blain, as the novel tells us, is a chill blain, dong sang, inflammatory swellings, zong, zong zang. Inflammatory means fa yan. Swelling means zong zang, produced by cold. So to be hurt by cold, chill blains, zong, dong sang. So uh, now that now that the children are all out of the house, the nursery maid is so bored that she she spends her time mending stockings and um, helping to take care of all the chillblains and bruises that happen. That she could get near her. This tells us that she's just very bored. She's waiting for someone to be hurt so that she has something to do. And who consequently consequently means therefore was only too happy in being allowed to go and help nurse dear Miss Louisa. Vague wishes of getting Sarah thither. Sarah must be the name of the nursery maid. Thither means there or over there or to there. So wishes of getting Sarah thither means the idea of having Sarah go to Louisa. Had occurred before to Mrs. Musgrove and Henrietta. So Mrs. Musgrove and Henrietta had previously already thought of sending Sarah to take care of Louisa. But without Anne, it would hardly have been resolved on and found practicable so soon. So again, remember Mrs. Musgrove is worried, is disturbed, cannot make decisions and plans for the future because her emotions are so troubled. So with Anne there, only with Anne there were they able to resolve, which means decide to send Sarah uh, and to actually do it. So uh, to make sure that it is a good plan, it is practicable. It can be done. So soon, so again, Anne is helping out. They were indebted the next day to Charles Hayter for all the minute knowledge of Louisa, which it was so essential to obtain every 24 hours. So to be indebted means to be grateful, to be thankful. Uh, and this is because Charles Hayter shows up the next day to give very detailed knowledge about Louisa, uh, which it was so essential to obtain every 24 hours, which means the family at Uppercross were so worried about Louisa that they absolutely had to have the latest information every day. He, Charles Hayter, made it his business to go to Lyme and his account was still encouraging. Still here means even more, even more encouraging. This is a uh, meaning that we don't use much today. So Charles Hayter ran to Lyme and ran back with the news. Uh, and if the news is encouraging, that means it's not bad news. The so what is the news? The intervals of sense and consciousness were believed to be stronger. So interval means a brief period of time. So apparently Louisa is not in a in a dead coma. She sometimes wakes up and then falls back asleep. Uh, and when she's awake, she is not always lucid or aware or reasonable or rational. So the short periods of time when she does have sense and does have consciousness, which means she is awake, 
or believed to be stronger. So it looks like she's getting a bit better every day. Every report agreed in Captain Wentworth's appearing fixed in Lyme. So uh, up to this point, all the reports have been talking about Louisa. But finally, it says here that every report agreed that Captain Wentworth would. Uh, he appeared set on staying in Lyme next to Louisa. This is important information. Uh, and it's it's why uh, Jane Austen held this information back until the very last line. It's important for two reasons. First, it's important for everybody who believes that Captain Wentworth wants to marry Louisa. They're thinking, oh, he cares about her so much. He loves her so much. Of course he's going to stay at Lyme next to her. Um, when in fact we know that's not the reason. We know that Captain Wentworth is only there because he feels guilty. Uh, he feels guilty that he did not stop Louisa from jumping that last time. So he feels guilty about uh, leading her to have this accident. So he's staying there out of guilt. Uh, I think at this point in the novel, I think the reader also thinks that Captain Wentworth is going to marry Louisa. So, I mean, if you look up the story on Wikipedia or like watch the movie, you know there's a movie, right? Uh, there's actually three movies, but apparently the best movie is the one directed by Mitchell. Uh, so if you want to uh, watch the movie, you can look for that. I should warn you though, um, when you do watch the movie, uh, because it's a movie and in order to save time and to make things more clear, it changes some of the details of the story. So when you take the final exam and you have to look for evidence, uh, the movie may confuse you. You may be remembering parts of the movie and not of the novel. So if you do watch the movie, please be careful about that. Uh, OK, yeah, so if you know the story, you'll know that Captain Wentworth actually uh, marries Anne. I think that's pretty obvious from the beginning of the story, right? The question is only how does he get to that point? Um, so we, we kind of get the idea that he is not going to marry Louisa, but at this point everyone thinks that he will. And the fact that he stays by Louisa's side um, just gives everyone more evidence to, in that belief. Because like Captain Wentworth is not family. This is the same logic as when he rescued Anne from the young child Walter. He's not family, and yet he's behaving like family. So the reasonable conclusion is that he wants to be family. He wants to become family by marrying Louisa. So that's the first important reason why this information is important. The second reason is because if Anne ever decides to go to Lyme again, she will know that he is still there so she can mentally prepare herself. She won't be surprised by him. Uh, OK, continuing. Uh, hang on, let me yawn again. Why am I yawning so much? <sighs> <sighs> Must be the weather, I don't know. OK, um, continuing. Anne was to leave them on the morrow, which means tomorrow. An event which they all dreaded. Nobody was looking forward to this. What should they do without her? They were wretched comforters for one another. Uh, remember when the accident first happened, it was Anne who kept a clear head and was able to comfort everyone. And so much was said in this way that Anne thought she could not do better than impart among them the general inclination to which she was privy and persuade them all to go to Lyme at once. So this sentence is also very interesting. 
usually when someone says, oh, what would we do without you? The polite thing to say would be, oh, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Go on. Don't worry about things. That would be the polite thing. And we know that Anne often uh, does the polite thing even when she absolutely does not want to. But here. Uh, her general inclination, which means her own, which means her own opinion. Inclination means qingxiang. So her own opinion, her own idea. Uh, and we know that this is her idea because privy means uh, a secret knowledge. A private knowledge, so only she herself knows that she has this inclination. So it's her own idea. Uh, agrees with the polite thing. She actually does want them to go to Lyme at once. So it's saying that uh, faced with this situation, as so much was said in this way, uh, when Anne is considering all the different possible things she can do, which one is more polite, Anne thought she could not do better than impart or convey, communicate, among them, the general inclination to which she was privy, which means to tell them her own idea and persuade them all to go to Lyme at once. Uh, so it's very lucky of her that what she wants and what she should do are finally the same thing. And notice also this word persuade. Uh, they already want to go to Lyme. So the word persuade here is not actually changing their minds. It's kind of reassuring them, letting them feel like it's OK to go, to let them go. And I keep talking about this idea of persuasion or persuading because. Uh, first of all, it's the title of the book, so it's important. But secondly, oh, I don't know. It might appear on the final exam. Who knows? And so remember, persuade does not just mean to convince or to change someone's mind. It also refers to a kind of tendency or inclination qingxiang, that someone might have, a persuasion. And then finally here, it refers to how uh, and makes them feel like it's OK for them to go to line. Um, OK, so. Let's let's stop here. Let me stop the recording. <laughs>